Thank you, Kira. Thank you for this presentation of the, of the website. Very exciting to see all these new features. Right, so um, now our next session is uh, focusing on the work of uh, task forces, working groups and initiatives. And uh, we will start with a session on what's next. Just before we start, I'd like to remind uh, all the, the participants who have joined that you can listen to this session in various languages. So feel free to select at the bottom of your Zoom screen the language channel. So you can click on the icon with the globe and you can select the language um, that you would like. <laughs> Great. So, um, so now we have um, so a few, uh, few panelists. And um, so maybe, maybe it's actually good to start by introducing myself as well. So I'm Sandra Mignon, I'm the co-lead of the CAFAC Task Force. And I will be the facilitator for this session, along with uh, Camila, I will co-facilitate. So during the next uh, 30, session, uh, 30 minutes, we will hear from six working groups and task forces of the Alliance who will present their calming activities, what they have in the pipeline. And uh, without further ado, I will ask Silva, Silvia Onyate from the Child Labor Task Force to share what's next uh, for their task force. Thank Silvia, you. over to you. Thank you, Sandra, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. So uh, I'm going to share like a few uh, very exciting things for the Child Labor Task Force with what's next. Uh, in order to roll out and socialize the interagency global child labor toolkit with all practitioners, uh, which is called Preventing and Responding to Child Labor in Humanitarian Action and its regional versions, um, we're going to conduct two main activities. The first one, um, if you go to the next slide, um, what we'll do is we'll provide in-country and also remote technical support to four child labor responses in collaboration with coordination mechanisms in-country. For example, in July, uh, very soon, we're going to start with the training uh, in Iraq of uh, child protection working group members who have already requested and identify uh, child labor as an area to focus and prioritize. For trainees, we'll use the new learning package, uh, which consists of pre-assignments and also uh, facilitated live sessions that target either child protection specialists, uh, frontliners, but also development and other humanitarian sector colleagues. And on the slide, you can see the diagram of the different steps for participants uh, being part of the training process. The second activity, if you go to the next slide, um, we will uh, also conduct online trainings in collaboration with regional networks um, for the rollout of the Child Labor Toolkit. And most likely the regions will be um, MENA, uh, Middle East and Northern Africa region, Latin America and the Caribbean, and East and Southern Africa region. The online trainings will be conducted in English, Arabic, and Spanish. And we are still um, in the process of finalizing the details to ensure like it uh, meet the needs of the regional colleagues. More details and dates uh, will follow. And finally, um, and also very exciting piece that is coming next for the Child Labor Task Force. If you go to the next slide, is the work that we will do with education colleagues. We know education is critical uh, for successful prevention and response to child labor in humanitarian settings. So in order to strengthen the capacity of education program practitioners to better design and implement quality programs to prevent and respond to child labor in humanitarian action, 
Uh, we are planning to develop a joint paper with education colleagues to promote multi-sector and integrated programming um, on child labor among practitioners. And this will include also key recommendations, um, very practical. So watch this space and uh, stay tuned and we will share uh, the link to the microsite um, where you can access all the resources. Thank you very much, Sandra and everyone. Thank you, Sylvia. That sounds uh, really interesting. So um, now we'll hand over to Michelle Van Aken from the Prevention Initiative. Michelle, over to you. Great, thanks so much, Sandra. Um, so I will be presenting on behalf of the Prevention Initiative. Um, you might be wondering why there's caution tape on my slide and it's because this funding is still pending confirmation. So this is what we are hoping to be doing. Um, in the coming years, but uh, fingers crossed for us and knock on wood um, while we are going through the last rounds of the proposal process. Um, so if this funding comes through, the prevention initiative um, will be taking on the next step. Now that we have finished the um, primary prevention framework, we will then be able to roll it out. So we will be doing four regional level virtual trainings on the prevention framework using the learning package developed by the L&D working group. We will then also do one global level virtual training of trainers on the prevention framework. Um, following this dissemination, we'll then have virtual clinics with interagency actors seeking to pilot the prevention framework. So if you or your organization are interested in piloting the prevention framework in your contexts, we would have a prevention focal point on hand to provide additional trainings, provide advice and support that piloting process. Um, following the virtual clinics, as well as some in-country piloting that plan will be leading on behalf of the Alliance, we will then revise the prevention framework to take into account learnings from in-country piloting and the virtual clinics. Um, simultaneously, we will also be working on developing an m and &E addendum to the prevention framework. Um, this addendum will take into account the very unique needs of monitoring and evaluation of a primary prevention approach. Um, and these resources will be developed during in-country piloting and with our virtual uh, partners in the virtual clinics. Um, and we'll just be able to provide a framework building on existing tools and resources, but that take into account those specific considerations of how do you measure harm that's prevented before it can occur. Um, we will also be working with the advocacy working group on a prevention advocacy roadmap to add on to the Alliance advocacy strategy. So looking at how can we as, a, as the Alliance effectively advocate for the uptake of primary prevention approaches among both our, um, our colleagues in the child protection sector, as well as across uh, the humanitarian, across the humanitarian sector more broadly. Um, and then throughout this project, we would be having advocacy and knowledge sharing events um, to both share what we are learning from piloting the prevention framework on what is effective to prevent harm at a population level, um, as well as lessons learned on what did and did not work with the framework and what we've needed to revise, as well as conducting advocacy, looking at the, um, the evidence and the data that we're collecting throughout piloting and virtual clinics and sharing those lessons and sharing those, um, those messages around the impact of primary prevention programming in child protection and humanitarian action. So um, to sum up, as I said, we are still waiting on final confirmation of this funding. Um, so it's not official yet, but we wanted to share at this platform because we are hoping that it will come through. And if any of you attending this uh, annual meeting are interested in either the trainings that we'll be offering or in participating in the clinics, you know, you can reach out to myself um, or you can reach out to, uh, yeah, you could reach out to myself about uh, about that interest um, or to the Alliance and to Camilla and Hani as well, I believe. Um, but we are very much looking forward to this very exciting and innovative project. Thank you. Back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Michelle. And fingers crossed that uh, the, the funding comes through. Right, so now um, I will hand over to Katie Robertson from the Learning and Development Working Group. Katie, over to you. Thank you, Sandra. 
Um, so we have three updates from the LND Working Group on what we're working on and what's coming next. So first of all, the CPHA CPMS learning package, which replaces the previous child protection in emergencies face-to-face -face training package, um, is ready. It's now available. So the package is designed to help build entry to mid-level skills and knowledge for child protection in humanitarian contexts. And it aims at strengthening participants' awareness of their own role in preventing and responding to child protection risks through sectoral and intersectoral interventions. Um, it lines up with the child protection minimum standards and the guiding principles. And the package is blended in format, so it's a mixture of self-paced um, learning activities and facilitated group learning activities. It can be delivered either fully online um, or with a face-to-face -face component. And the draft is now available in English for field testing. And then we will take some feedback and finalize um, early next year, hopefully, and then translate into other languages. Secondly, we're working on two um, CPHA primary prevention framework videos to help to illustrate some of the aspects of the primary prevention framework. These should be ready in mid to late September um, in a number of languages. And finally, we're hoping to set up a new learning platform for the Alliance to help us systematize learning resources for learners and also for facilitators. Um, so stay tuned on that one. And not a lot of information to share yet, but we'll be working on it in the last quarter of the year and hope to share more there. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Um, so now we will hear from the um, uh, children associated with armed forces and armed groups uh, task force with uh, Giovanna Vio. <laughs> Giovanna, over to you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and good afternoon, everyone. So um, this year, um, the CAFAC task force um, is actually working on a few different projects, and we thought we would highlight only two today. So the first one is the development of a MOOC, which stays for massive open online course on um, CAFAC, children associated with armed forces and armed groups. And in particular, we're adapting the CAFAC program development toolkit training package. The, the MOOC is intended to upskill practitioners that have already um, experience in child protection and program development, but it's not a comprehensive child protection or child protection in humanitarian action capacity building course. It focuses on how to design and implement successful program for, for CAFAC. And in terms of who it is for, um, the course is designed for child protection managers or advisors who are in charge of designing, implementing, reviewing, and or generally supporting programs for CAFAG. With respect to what it includes, so um, the MOOC will include basic concepts on CAFAG and the legal and, and normative framework, information on how to implement a context analysis, um, it will include also some tips on how to design programs for CAFAG and um, focusing on the key stages of prevention, um, release and reintegration of CAFAG. Um, it will include key considerations in program implementation and monitoring of for CAFAG programs. And finally, it will offer some learning um, on program learning and an evaluation. And in terms of when it will be accessible, it will be um, hopefully ready by November this year and available on the Future Learn platform in English, French and Spanish. And moving on to the next uh, resource, um, Yes, in 2022, um, there will, we will also develop a two um, cross-sector guidance notes, which will aim to promote um, collaboration with other sectors to better prevent recruitment and address the needs of um, children associated with armed forces and armed groups. Um, the background for this is that we conducted an online survey back in April this year and 45 practitioners from multiple regions and contexts um, participated. And the purpose of the survey was to ask respondents who have the, um, direct experience in implementing programs for CAFAG, what sectors they will want to see prioritized for the development of the guidance notes. And we also asked them to share some experiences in working across sectors while implementing CAFAG, CAFAG programs, as well as what type 
type of resource they would like or guidance they would like to um, to see produced. And respondents identified um, education and livelihood as the two sectors for the guidance nodes. So we will follow that lead. And um, in terms of um, what the guidance will reflect, we will um, we will look at how the two sectors uh, play a role in addressing the needs um, uh, and the risk faced by by CAFAC. Um, as I said, um, the respondents also offered some examples of good practices um, in working with these two sectors um, and how they, they feed into CAFAC programs. For education, we know that this may include referrals or the presence of case workers in schools, um, education interventions to prevent recruitment. For livelihood, um, it, it, they mentioned um, uh, livelihood activities, both within the prevention and the response strategy. Um, through, for example, provision of ca um, cash vouchers for families or vocational training, life skills and others. And um, so all to say, I'm running out of time that uh, we will be working on this in um, coordination with other uh, strategy uh, with other initiatives that were presented. And uh, we hope that we will have the guidance notes ready, one in 2022 and one in 2023. This is all for me and thank you. And back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Giovanna. Uh, I see one comment in the... Um in the chat um, talking about MHPSS uh, integrated under CP. I'm not sure, um, Leila, would you, is this question towards, um, for Giovanna? Uh, yes, it was just, sorry, um, it was, hi everyone. It was just linked to the selected sectors. Um, and I was just wondering, I mean, I, I imagine MHPSS is usually also linked in with um, with CP, but also as they are also other guidance around um, HPSS, I was just wondering how that was integrated in the guidance. We um, have a couple of minutes, so Giovanna, yeah, feel free to respond. And, and Sandra, um, we are, <laughs> but uh, yeah, we haven't um, yet started working on the on the content of the guidance notes, but um, we will look at ways uh, in which education and uh, livelihood feed into CAFAC programs. So we know we will take into account um, the work that is done also in other working groups um, uh, when it comes to general integration and um, collaboration between child protection and other sectors. But uh, of course, MHPSS um, is, is an, it's, it's almost like it, it's a part, it's also a cross-cutting theme when we know, and uh, it's it's always disputed as to whether it should be considered separate from child protection. Um, but um, for example, in the work that we'll be doing in schools, for sure we will um, add and include considerations that look specifically at, um, at MHPSS and not just at the, you know, the child protection in itself. Um, and same, I would say, for livelihood. So MHPSS will be um, uh, feeding through both nodes as to how, because we know that obviously CAFA will need um, that intervention uh, as well as, uh, you know, other um, type of uh, more case management or um, uh, interventions um, across the, 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 the sort of support that they will receive from prevention to, to, to response. So I don't know if that re in response, but basically we still have like a blank canvas and uh, we're going to be uh, trying to um, be as comprehensive as possible as well as to follow a consultative process. So um, we will give you, um, and also obviously Leila, you're part of the CAFA task force, so you will be directly involved in, in shaping that. I hope that answers. Thank you, Giovanna. Thank you. Uh, right, so now we'll hand over to um, Cliff Speck from uh, the Unaccompanied and Separated Task Force. Thanks so much, uh, Sandra. Um, yeah, if you can move to the next slide, thanks. Yeah, so I just want to start off by situating the work of the UAC Task Force in what's uh, probably the, the consistent uh, child protection risk uh, that we face, uh, which is family separation. Um, be it Ukraine, be it uh, um, Ethiopia, or uh, recently again uh, in Uganda with the influx from DRC, Mozambique, and so on. And uh, not to mention uh, today's earthquake in Afghanistan is likely to leave uh, many more children separated from their families. So um, 
and and uh, considering the situation in Ukraine, it is also ongoing. Uh, developments around the question of uh, what do we mean by unaccompanied and separated children and the question of jurisdiction over unaccompanied and separated children when they have crossed the international border. So the work of the UAC task force uh, is kind of uh, needs to be framed within this. Uh, but uh, over the past year, uh, the UAC task force has been working on trying to disseminate the existing tools that uh, have been uh, in place for some years uh, that uh, you see on your screen, of course, uh, the USC handbook and the USC uh, toolkit. Uh, and the membership has been uh, also uh, promoting these uh, through their own uh, organizations in the field. Uh, but what we also felt uh, through multiple discussions is there is also a need for uh, particular guidance and uh, an enhancement of existing uh, training package uh, that covers the topic of family uh, prevention of family separation. Uh, if you move to the next one. Uh, so um, what we did was uh, we initiated a fundraising uh, process and uh, managed to secure small funding uh, to identify and uh, recruit uh, two consultants to help us develop a, a guidance uh, that will uh, complement the task force uh, USC uh, handbook and toolkit. Uh, on prevention and also to update the training of trainer package that we already have available. So uh, the task force aims to finalize this by the end of the year um, and uh, have them published uh, after a exercise of uh, field testing. Um, so it's, it's much work to do uh, in terms of uh, ensuring that we are reviewing it, it aligns with uh, the different uh, uh, elements of the handbook and toolkit, but the existing uh, TOT as well, and the work of the other task force and uh, working groups. Um, so uh, brings me to the next point, uh, which you will find uh, in the next slide, is uh, the USC task force needs more people and more uh, uh, members uh, that uh, with experience from across the world in different uh, contexts. So I just wanted to take this opportunity on behalf of the membership of the UAC task force to call upon uh, organizations and, uh, and representatives who are here at the meeting to join the UAC task force, to bring in your expertise, to bring your knowledge and skills at the local community and uh, national level to contribute to the work that I just uh, described, especially on prevention, uh, but also other works that we will want to develop uh, over the year and uh, look forward to uh, implementing in 2023. So you, you see the contact information of the task force uh, as well as the website. Uh, uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, that uh, link has changed uh, since the new site was launched. Uh, we'll put that in the in the chat as well. So more membership, uh, more members, more work to do because the issue of family uh, uh, separation remains a critical child protection issue for us. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Cliff. Um, and um, then we will end with the um, assessment, measurement, and the evidence uh, working group with Lynn Dicat. Lynn, over to you. Thank you, Sandra. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Lynn Dicat. I represent uh, World Vision in the AMI working group together with Innocenti and uh, my colleague from Innocenti, the UNICEF's Office of Research, apologizes he, is, he couldn't make it a scheduling clash. Um, I would like to highlight uh, three points, uh, our scope of work, let's say between now and the end of uh, this year, 2022. Um, and of course, we built, we are new in this role, but we built on what the working group has been doing uh, in the last years, their work plan, and we have also developed a draft strategy. First and foremost, uh, with the help of, uh, we were so lucky to find a great consultant uh, who is supporting us, uh, Stephen hamner Dilia. So together we will start focusing on developing a qualitative approach to assess uh, population level risk and protective factors 
for the protection of children with disabilities, because we've seen that this is a gap in, uh, in the tools and the guidance in the Alliance uh, overall. You know that children in humanitarian context, children with disabilities are among, among those most at risk. So we really feel that this is a top priority for us. Um, and so we can develop something practical, um, Oh, my battery is low. Something practical for all levels of the assessment, preparedness, and response. Secondly, um, we would also we aim to develop a standalone uh, capacity building module on measuring uh, risk and protective factors to strengthen uh, preventive preventative approaches uh, of our work. So, really, something practical, standalone module. Uh, to help you to measure uh, the factors. And then uh, thirdly, um, as we are uh, focusing on assessment, measure, measurement, evidence, it goes without saying that our role is also there to support other working groups and um, initi initiatives and task forces. So if the other working groups um, who are doing fantastic uh, work if they need a lens from us, we are there uh, on an ongoing basis uh, to support. Um, we have submitted um, a proposal for funding to the donor PRM. It's also pending confirmation, but we are hopeful uh, that this is going to, yeah, to allow us to do the work we want to do. Uh, back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Lean. Thank you very much. So I see that we have a few questions in the chat. So I will encourage the different um, uh, panelists to respond uh, directly to the one you can. I think I will maybe just address the one uh, in French. So there is one question from um, Miriam who uh, says that she feels like there is not enough uh, opportunities for French speakers to attend training sessions. And uh, often she feels like it's, um, it's not available in French. So she asks if it's possible to have an, uh, interpreters to, to help people with uh, French, um, from French speaking countries to attend those sessions. And then she talks specifically about the one on prevention. So uh, maybe I can ask uh, Michelle. Michelle, do you know if in the training on prevention you have planned um, it to be in various languages? Um, yeah, thank you so much for this question. I was actually about to respond to it in the chat. Um, but so for the prevention trainings, um, our hope is to be able to provide them in multiple languages. That's why we would like to do them at a regional level. Um, so that is our, our, our goal. Um, however, uh, funding resources were tight. So uh, we may, you know, we may need to be asking some of our partners within the Alliance to support on that. And that's one of the reasons we're looking at a global TOT as well is to train up a broader range of actors who may then be able to support in rolling out the trainings in various languages as well. Um, so our, our hope is to be able to have the regional trainings in various languages. Um, it's pending uh, final budget considerations. Thank you. And maybe Katie, if you'd like to speak uh, from the perspective of the learning and development working group more broadly, like so beyond just the training on prevention, what is your take on offering those, in, those opportunities in multiple languages? Yeah, thanks, Sandra. It's definitely a great question. Um, and it's something we're trying really hard to ensure that the packages we're developing are available in at least English, French, Spanish and Arabic. Um, with the CPHA CPMS package, so far it's only in English because we want to do some piloting before we translate so we don't have to update all of the versions. We can we can just finalise one. Um, and the one day prevention training also something that we're hoping to translate very soon so it's we're certainly something that we're working hard to do um, and it's generally just a question of, of the resources available for us to do that but, um it's a really good point and i'm glad it was raised 
Thank you, Katie. And I know that with um, the CAFAG MOOC, so this a massive open online course that is coming at the end of the year, it will be also available in few languages, uh, including French. So we are, uh, I think, globally as the Alliance, trying to be more and more uh, cautious of making all those resources available in various languages. All right, so thank you. Thank you to all the panelists for this What's Next uh, session. And, uh, and now we will move to uh, the next session, which is um, a panel discussion with uh, some working groups and uh, initiatives and task forces. And we're gonna talk specifically about localization. So feel free to continue uh, exchanging in the chat. People can keep answering questions. I think that's glad to see all this uh, interaction. Uh, so keep going. And uh, as a transition to this uh, other session, we would like to know uh, where in the world uh, you're calling from. So we can see now we have a few more people. So we would like to know where you're working. So you can, uh, you will find in the chat a link to a Mentimeter so that you can locate yourself on the map. I think all producers will put in the chat a link to a Mentimeter. All right, here we go. So here's the link um, that you can open. You will see a map. And then you can pin yourself on this map so we know um, who is in the room, where you're attending from this session. All right, now we can see the map. Interesting, right? A lot of people from Africa, Europe, from America, Latin America as well, Australia, Asia is coming as well. Wow. That's great. That's at least one of the few advantages of this online version of virtual meeting is that people can attend from all over the world. And uh, I'm, I'm glad to see so many people joining the session. So thank you. So um, now let's move to our panel discussion. Um, and uh, so for the next uh, session, we will we will talk specifically about um, localization. So we have um, task forces, working groups, and global initiatives who have done some work. And uh, today we're gonna hear about how they contributed to the strategic priority of the Alliance, focusing on, um, on localization. So we have three leads of three task forces and initiatives today who will talk about their activities. So first we have the community level child protection task force. Then uh, we have the learning and development working group and the global initiative on child protection in humanitarian action and education in emergencies. Uh, so we have two people from that last initiative who will talk about their contribution to, um, to localization. Before we dive a bit more into, um, into our panel discussion, we would like to hear from you um, what it means and then what it means to you uh, localization. We know localization is like one of this kind of new words that we're hearing a lot more and more. But we would like to hear from your perspective, how does it resonate, what it means. So we will have a, um, another link, probably the same link, a Mentimeter link, where you can share your thoughts. And then uh, I will share the perspective of the Alliance on this uh, priority. So I think you can use the same Mentimeter link that you use for the map. And so feel free to share just a few words about when we say localization, what does it mean to you? So we have a first response, uh, being guided by local communities and structures in no response. Yes. So kind of a bottom up type of approach, right? Contextual and practical models and approaches. Yes, being uh, context driven. All right, 
ownership and leadership of local communities, yes. To contextualize interventions with local community-based organizations and communities. Ownership, yes, that's another keyword. Empowerment as well, empowerment of the local communities. Inclusion of those local organizations. Having a deep understanding of the context, adaptation, respecting community knowledge, right? So yes, so a lot of different, um, different perspectives, but some key words that we still see across, huh? contextualization, ownership, empowerment, these are key words that seems to resonate with, um, with most people. Excellent, so thank you all for your responses. So now I will share the, the perspective of the Alliance, what it means for the Alliance uh, when we talk about localization. So as you can see, this is like a, a summary of the, uh, the strategy 2125 for the Alliance. And uh, localization is the second strategic priority. And um, with this, um, with this priority here, we think about uh, basically the ambition of the Alliance is to transform the child protection sector's way of working uh, rooted in the sharing of capacity, expertise, opportunity, and the intentional shift of power and resources to community, uh, local and national actors. So that's, basically the vision of the Alliance. This is what we're aiming for. And, um, but it's still quite broad, right? Uh, so now let's see what it practically uh, means for us. So here are like, um, so next slide, please. Here are some of the uh, practical implications. So this means shifting power, influence, resources, and leadership to national child protection actors across humanitarian action. So next on the slide, thank you. This means also exploring and defining funding mechanism and direct funding to national child protection organizations. Next. Next. This means uh, engagement with national actors in prevention and response effort in, uh, and the development and contextualization of child protection standards, guidance, and tools. This means sharing knowledge and expertise between national and international actors across the sector. And lastly, this means improving and expanding the accessibility and diversity of learning opportunities, right? So that's kind of a, a summary of what we mean by localization. So it means a lot of things, right? It's not just one thing. So I think most of you um, had um, in their understanding is, is linking to one of these uh, points. And we also already talked about some of them, right? When we talk about uh, the languages in which we give the resources, um, which are then available on, on the website. Um, and so these are some of the uh, examples. So before we move to the panel discussion, um, we would like to acknowledge that this um, priority is a work in progress. And the few examples that you will hear today do not reflect all the actions that the Alliance is taking towards localization, right? These are just few examples from some of the task forces and working groups. Um, there is more, but we also need to do more. So that's uh, also important to acknowledge. So now I will invite our speakers to introduce themselves. Michelle, would you like to go first? 
Sure. Hi, everyone. So my name is Michelle Van Aken, and I work with Plan International as a child protection specialist. Um, while in the last session, I was work presenting on the prevention initiative. In this panel, I will be representing the community level child protection task force. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Elena, would you like to go next? Sure. Thanks, Sandra. And hi, everyone. My name is Elena Giannini, and I'm the Learning and Development and Development Working Group uh, co-lead at the Alliance for Child Protection and Humanitarian Action. Good to be here with you all. Back to you, Sandra. Thank you, Elena. Uh, Rachel, would like to Hi, go next? I'm Rachel McKinney. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's a little early here. Um, I actually sit between both the Alliance and INEE, so I am the technical focal point for CPHA and EIE in humanitarian response. Um, and I lead the joint initiative for um, child protection and education and emergencies, the, the collaboration and, and partnership between the two networks. Thank you, Rachel. And then Jonas. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jonas Yabimana. I'm representing Bifed the uh, as a national NGO based in the DRC. And they also I'm working in the DRC as a focal point for INE minimum standards in DRC. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you today. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. So Jonas um, is also working as a partner of the initiative on child protection and education in emergencies. <laughs> excellent. So we're delighted to have those four excellent panelists with us today. And um, you're welcome to ask questions as we start the panel discussions to ask questions in the chat. And we will take time um, after we've heard from a panelist to, to respond to your questions. So let's start with uh, our first question. So now that we know a bit more what localization means for the Alliance, we're interested to hear on how working groups, task forces, and initiative have contributed towards achieving this priority. So Elena, would you like to tell us how the learning and development working group has contributed to localization? Let's put it this way, let's how we are trying to contribute to this <laughs> like priority. But yes, of course. So a lot of what we do in the learning and development working group is intrinsically connected with the localization because it looks at strengthening the capacities of those that are in on the front line and those that are the, that are on the front line, you know. Uh, more often being local NGOs, especially since the wake of COVID-19, but even before that. Um, we have tried to start, you know, we have tried to listen to the needs like of those that are on the front line, first and foremost. And how do we do that? We uh, try and learn what the needs are in terms of capacity strengthening um, through, um, learning needs and learning gaps and ne learning needs analysis. Sorry, I'm stumbling on my English today. And we have done so for the COVID-19 initiative. We have also cooperated with the CAFA Trust with the CAFA task force uh, prior to the development of uh, the toolkit on one of these type of exercises. Similarly, we have also consulted widely or as widely as possible um, with practitioners before setting up the um, uh, community of practice in cooperation with the global CPAOR colleagues. And we're pleased to say that as of today, um, I mean, stats are not just of yesterday, so we might be able to share uh, updated stats soon, but we had 31% of national NGOs and, and, and registered on the community of practice. The, we still have a good strong 36% of like international NGOs, but I think 31% speaks uh, to an achievement for now. And we are hoping certainly to uh, see those numbers growing. Um, we have also tried like to ensure that like all of the learning products that uh, we have worked on, 
are uh, truly accessible like to others and to colleagues on uh, on the ground and we always foster the trans we always encourage or we try and promote the translation of all the resources in at least all the basic languages Spanish, Arabic, and French, but we don't always get there because of funding issues. And we have also consulted like with a group of national NGOs like to develop a mini guide on the contextualization of learning packages. So we have taken some steps and there is much more that we need to do, um, but that's where we are roughly at like with, uh, for our learning, uh, for the working group, Sandra. Thank you. Thank you, Elena. Um, yeah, I can see all the efforts of the <laughs> learning and development working group. And, and indeed, like just the translation, because we've been there as well with the CAFAC task force. Like, we know it's not easy. It takes time. But when it's there, like what an achievement. <laughs> Thank you. Michelle, would you like to share from the community level task force? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the community level child protection task force has highlighted the role of communities in localization and also questioned how we are engaging with communities in localization and what role that should be can and should be. Um, our work in developing the reflective field guide, which included an extensive review of the existing literature on community based and community led approaches highlighted the need to progress from community-based, so very top-down, NGO-led, to community-led programming um, per the Benham typology, which would be a much more localized approach, relying on communities themselves to design, implement, and lead child protection programming. Uh, this research and resulting guide uh, emphasized the key role that communities play in protecting children and that communities have pre-existing mechanisms to protect children and that we should be seeking to strengthen those mechanisms rather than replace them with a top-down approach. Therefore, I mean, very clearly, uh, the CCP task force is, you know, very much wants to seek to strengthen communities as part of a localization approach. However, um, the next piece of work that we, we supported in cooperation with the case management task force um, on community engagement and case management also raised ethical questions on how we are engaging communities in humanitarian action, particularly case management. Um, some of the questions that came out of this piece of work was whether we are expecting community volunteers who receive only a small incentive and are actually from the impacted populations that we are seeking to support to engage in what could be considered as full-time, highly specialized work for which they should be brought on as staff and, and, fully, and fairly compensated as such. So that then raised this question, how are we engaging with communities and are we actually empowering them um, and recognizing them as our equals in our work? Um, Therefore, the Community Level Child Protection Task Force has emphasized this need to engage with communities and strengthen their existing mechanisms to protect children, while also critically reflecting on what we are asking communities to do and ensuring that we are not placing the burden of implementing NGO prioritized programming on those very communities we're seeking to support. So to, to summarize, we are very much looking at how can we ethically engage with communities in localization and empower them in that process and work with them as equal partners. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Yes, and that's, I think this, it's a whole, it's also a mind shift for all of us working in a sector. And I think the terminology that you're using now, like shifting from community-based to uh, community-guided and led, I think that's that's a first step um, towards um, more localization and more engagement from the community. Thanks. Um, now let's hear from Jonas. Uh, Jonas, can you share your your perspective as a partner of the Education and Child Protection Initiative? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sandra, and the, all the participants. Uh, my experience in uh, child protection and education. Uh, initiatives is that uh, first, as a national NGO based uh, at a local level in DRC, uh, we have been funded by the 
Protection Technology Foundation with uh, a support from the Alliance of Child Protection in humanitarian action and also a network to run a research on school closure in DRC. We conducted our research on the impact of COVID-19 uh, on the school closure in DRC as a national NGO. And uh, doing this research gave us a power at the country level because we have been engaged with uh, the cluster, protection cluster and the education cluster at the regional and the country level. But also when we were doing our research, we have been able to mobilize many stakeholders. When we were uh, creating our advocacy group in Afkiv where we are based, we have engaged with all these stakeholders within the UN agencies, international organizations, national organizations, and also government authorities, those who are involved in education and the child protection sectors. We have been uh, engaged with a power and this gave us a value as a national NGO to be engaged in the research because we know that in the past years, the kind of researches have been only conducted by UN agencies, international NGOs, but to see how a national NGO have been involved in this process, this is really uh, an approach to ensure that a localization is also progressing very well in a DRC. But also, as you know, our organization is a member of the CPMS working group. Uh, in 2019, with the new version of the CPMS, when the launch has been done at the global level, in DRC, we discussed with our child protection working group who is under uh, Save Children leadership. We discussed to see how we can be promoting CPMS at the country level. And the child protection working group decided to give us a small fund to see how we can be doing workshops in different provinces in terms of uh, giving feedback on there's the national and the local NGOs who were not able to attend the country level launch because most of these NGOs cannot have access to internet and they need to have access to the CPMS standards. We organized workshops in North Kivu. We organized workshops in South Kivu and Ituri province. Can we imagine to see how a national NGO like ours was able to, to, to do these workshops in these different provinces involving different stakeholders within national NGOs, international NGOs, and they also uh, the working group was also supporting our, our work. I think that gives us also leadership in terms of uh, promoting CPMS. And uh, it, it gives us also uh, a kind of um, um, authority because you know localization means also leadership and authority to these national NGOs. We coordinated with existing coordination mechanism and this have been very, 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 very good understood by all these stakeholders. And for now, we are now still discussing with the, the country level, uh, with the child protection uh, working group to see how we can be now doing many, many other workshops at the country level. We, the country has more than 26 provinces. We, we are a very biggest country, but now discussion are now ongoing with seven children to see how we can continue doing this kind of promotion of a CPMS at the country level. And we hope that it will give us a strong leadership and a, a decision making in terms of promoting the child minimum standards in terms of child protection. Over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Jonas, and thank you for sharing your experience. I think that's, that's a great example of this shift of power that we were just talking about, right? How you and then at the, at the local level are able to organize these workshops and, and, and conduct this, uh, this research. And that gives you the credibility then to talk to other authorities and other stakeholders. So thank you. Uh, so now let's move to our next uh, question. So is there something, so now we've heard about all the things you've done. Now, is there something like in the pipeline that will contribute towards achieving localization? Um, Elena, is there anything 
in the pipeline of the L&D working group? Yeah, so let me start by saying that for us, capacity strengthening, we don't use anymore the term capacity building or we try not to, um, is the, um, so capacity strengthening between international and local NGOs is a two-way process where um, international actors take the opportunity to learn from national actors, you know, their knowledge, but also all the you know, wealth of experiences that they have, like in the political, social cost context where they're operating. For this reason, we would like to end the baton so of the LD working group to um, our colleagues from national NGOs. And we have had, like in our work plan, an initiative which is to foster a, a number of uh, learning events online, which are led by national NGOs. We haven't got around like uh, to starting that activity quite yet, but I think it's something that uh, we will prioritize in the fall. So if there are any local NGOs which are interested like in spreading these events with us, that would be amazing. You know, in the meantime, we'll obviously continue with the rest of our activities as well, like in terms of um, investing in the community of practice, because we want to really make that the place for practitioners like all over the world to exchange, find the resources, suggestions, et cetera. And finally, like we'd also like to be there more as an help desk for those that are on the ground. So really promote uh, the nature of the L&D working group as a resource for others to help you set up your learning experiences like in your context. So we can support with developing learning needs analysis, with the evaluation of learning programs, with the contextualization of global learning packages that uh, might be more challenging uh, to adapt. Um, one last thing, like for the community of practice, like as well, we will be, uh, so there is plenty of things in the pipeline, so I'm forgetting some bits. In the community of practice, we will also promote some spotlight on members where you'll be able to feature uh, NGOs, local NGOs um, work um, more prominently. So look out for that as well. Um, yeah, so that would be it, Sandra, from our side. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, very interesting things. Um, Rachel, what are your plans for the Education and Child Protection Initiative? So one of the biggest products that we're working on right now that builds off of earlier work um, uh, completed by the CPHA EIE Joint Initiative is a, a set of guidance notes that will um, bring together points of convergence between child protection and, and education emergencies. And I know all of us work, um, you know, in <clears throat> within one sector, but we always butt up against other sectors. And I think um, child protection and education, as I've listened to the panelists and, and sessions over the past two days, it's clear that there's been considerable work already conducted between stakeholders at country level, but in formalizing the joint initiative between the two networks, this allowed us to really think about how we can best support, um, structurally best support the two sectors to come together. And so the, the product that we're completing now is a set of guidance notes that looks at a number of areas, including safe access to um, safe uh, learning spaces. Um, it looks at specific vulnerable uh, groups of children and the vulnerabilities as they are, as they might be mitigated by quality education or how they might contribute to um, issues around um, access and full participation of, of those children. Um, it looks at well-being of teachers as well as well-being of uh, children, learners, and caregivers, understanding that education, <clears throat> even as, as it's conceived sort of within the, the walls of a school, education extends beyond schools and, and into the communities. So 
looking at where child protection and, and education can best collaborate to strengthen programs. And the guidance note, although it, it builds off of global standards and it does not, um, it is not meant to uh, create or insert new guidance, it points people to existing guidance. We all know that there's a plethora of materials and resources uh, available through the Alliance, through IMEE, through a number of, of other network spaces and, and organizational spaces. And we've drawn on um, sort of core, core resources that already look at the intersection between the two um, sectors. So we're not, we're not creating anything new, we're streamlining um, and making more accessible those existing resources. But we do this um, not only by, you know, pointing people to the actual resources, but also through, um, uh, inserting a number of guiding questions that it, are meant to focus the two sectors, the stakeholders within the two sectors, and it might be within the same organization, you might be sitting next to each other, having these conversations. It might be between national coordination systems, having these two, two um, you know, those two stakeholders having um, conversations together. So it, it really, it's meant to not only build off of the global standards, but focus on the process of collaboration as well. And I know that one of the things that we struggle with, even when we do sit next to each other, is thinking about when and how to come together around what questions, around what types of analysis of vulnerabilities, of uh, analysis of accessibility and relevance of learning programs for um, children at risk. And the, the questions are really meant to, to help um, child protection and education stakeholders move through that process together so that eventually the interventions make sense for both sectors and both sectors see themselves in a more holistic um, structured response. And um, yeah, so it, it is more a compilation and then a, pro you know, a process to, to take us all through the, um, through the steps that are needed to really hone in on what makes the most sense for the children and communities that we're working with. Um, I think, mm -hmm. so I'd, I'd like to raise a couple of challenges um, because I, I know that, um, and I know Michelle has, has spoken about this as well, a large component of the, the guidance notes really focuses on how we involved children and communities in that process of both um, identifying areas or issues that we need to respond to, um, but also to think about how they are meaningfully engaged in every step of um, program implementation and uh, evaluation. And I think Thank one you, of the Rachel. challenges- Actually, yeah. we have, um, maybe we'll have time to come to that question sure. afterwards okay. on, on the challenges. Yeah. Uh, before I move to the next question, I'd like to ask Jonas also his perspective on, um, on this, like what you have in the pipeline, what comes next for you um, in DRC. Thank you very much, Sandra. Uh, my expectation is that uh, I think that uh, now, as an Alliance member, I can agree with you that uh, now localization is possible in uh, different countries because uh, since we have been engaged in the steering committee of the Alliance of Child Protection and Humanitarian Action, we have done many in terms of uh, attending uh, uh, steering committee meetings, that gives also a voice when we have been attending the governance structure from the Alliance. And also, as I said, as a, a naive focal point, it's possible to continue influencing uh, different stakeholders, especially the two clusters, uh, education cluster and the child protection clusters to ensure that uh, 
both clusters can be working together to progressing the collaboration between the two the two sectors. I think for, for now we have hope to continue highly engaged in this process. And it's possible because we are there, you are there, but we need to continue collaborating strongly uh, to exchanging on what we are facing in terms of uh, challenges and defining together solution and uh, continue collaborating on how we can be uh, achieving our localization agenda as an alliance. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Great. Um, so now um, that we have understand, we understood better, like how the working groups and task forces and initiatives contribute to localization, I'd like you to think about what are the critical changes that we must take uh, or make to achieve localization. And Michelle, would you like to go first? Sure, I'd be happy to. So. I mean, I touched upon a couple of the, the changes needed and the challenges in my first response, but I'd like to take a step back from just the community level child protection task force and, and look at localization more broadly as something that we are all seeking to achieve as child protection actors. And when we talk about achieving localization, it's always about the challenges and the barriers. Um, and Whenever we talk about localization, it's about implementing programming or activities, but the reality is that these activities and programming require funding. And the barriers for a local and organization to seek funding from an international humanitarian sector, from an international humanitarian donor and its donors are staggering. Um, it is not a problem unique to child protection. Uh, we work within a very rigid framework, both in terms of the technical standards that we place upon ourselves for quality programming, standards that we should seek to achieve and exist for a very good reason, but as well as the proposal and donor compliance processes. These are huge barriers to, to localization to a certain extent. Um, we are all very aware that it is extremely challenging for a local organization to successfully apply for funding from an international donor because of these barriers, because of the requirements when putting together a proposal. Um, however, this onus is then put on international NGOs and, their nat and national NGOs to work together to address these barriers, to partner together on proposals for funding. Um, and I want to be clear that these, these barriers and challenges, we're, we're, we're aware of them um, and we would love it if they were fewer, but we also can't necessarily change them. And when I say we, I mean, as international NGOs, I mean, as national NGOs, and I, even donors are in a difficult position in terms of these reporting, in terms of these proposal and compliance processes. Um, these are baked into the legal frameworks for major donor countries. Um, and, as, and within these legal frameworks, which ensure accountability and compliance to their populations, but within these legal frameworks, achieving localization is extremely difficult because you have to continuously work through partnerships and essentially continuously shift the risk to someone else and still work placing rigid legal structures on local organizations. So we are, Still expecting our local partners to comply with the donor um, rules and regulations. Again, I'm not saying that anyone within this situation is acting in bad faith. This is just the reality that we, we are in. Um, these legal frameworks and humanitarian standards exist for a reason and are necessary. Um, but we also have to remember why we value working with local partners and why we are seeking to achieve localization. It is both their knowledge of the local context, but also their ability to respond promptly. They have the flexibility to respond immediately to needs as they arise. Um, is it always with the programming um, that meets what we have set as necessary in a minimum service package or the minimum standards? Not necessarily, but is it tailored to their local context and the needs that they are observing? We have largely found that the answer to that question is yes. So we really have to ask ourselves, have we gotten ourselves into a position where with the best intentions, we have these standards, which I think if we're being honest with ourselves, we sometimes struggle to meet um, in all of our responses. Um, seeking to meet humanitarian principles 
people of humanity and ensuring people have access to the basic necessities to survive. But are those standards, both humanitarian standards, as well as the donor rules and regulations, um, preventing us from working effectively with local partners? I also believe the answer to this question is yes. And there's not an easy solution. I know the point of this question is what changes can we, can we implement? Um, and there's not an easy solution to this because as I said from the beginning, like the, these frameworks and these standards exist for a very important reason and we should be seeking to achieve them in our work. Um, but we do need to find a solution if we want to successfully localize humanitarian programming and empower local actors to do the work that they are already so good at. We need to acknowledge that the mandates and the standards guiding local partners may be different than the standards guiding an INGO. And that this is not necessarily bad or good, um, but it is something we need to discuss and ensure that we are not doing harm and recognize that just because perhaps a more local partner like a local CSO doesn't do something exactly how we as an INGO would do it does not mean it is wrong or bad and actually might be better tailored to the needs of that context. So we really need to think about what we mean by achieving localization. Um, and we need to make sure that we are working with local partners and not place shifting that responsibility or that burden onto local partners and to better adjust our standards and expectations and think about what we can do to meet them in the middle. Um, thank you. That's just some of my, my thoughts about what, how we can realistically get there. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Um, Rachel, would you like to share your perspective as well? It would help if I came off mute. Um, yeah. And I, I think similarly, I, there are a number of things I, I think we all know we need to do, um, but I'd like to touch on a, a couple of things. One of which is um, the, I think the increasing willingness of the humanitarian aid sort of world in general to think more critically about racism and decolonization in the humanitarian aid structures um, and, you know, I think this, that's seen in a number of, of small ways as well as large ways that need to shift the way that we look at um, our responses to the way that we look at creating resources that are relevant to the communities that we are working with and working for. Um, one of them has already been given at the beginning of this session, which is around language. I know that um, you know, most of the materials that are available on the Alliance and INEE are definitely available in, in English, maybe also another language. But I think until we are able to make it a standard approach to have materials available, in a variety of languages, not just the, the standard four or five languages that we tend to see. Um, you know, we're, we're still going to be faced with the inability of people to access and really use the resources that we spend so much time and, and energy and resource and, and financial resources and expertise on developing. So I think, you know, the, the willingness, first the willingness of of our own community to really think critically about how we have contributed to um, sort of systemic um, inequities um, in the past and, and our role in trying to chip away at that, however small or large. And I think we need to, I, I, I have seen and heard conversations that look at both the macro level, but also seen things um, of individual organizations and within network spaces to think about, you know, our, our best way of doing that within our own level of responsibility and accountability. And I think one of those is to unlearn a lot of the thinking and behaviors that stems from, you know, centuries of doing the same thing um, over and over from the use of, of the word charity, um, you know, the, how we label organizations that are, are collaborating or meant to collaborate with communities affected by crises. Um, 
you know, there, there are some very simple things, but the signals are, are very clear in both the language and attitude and then the, the actual approach. I think it's, it's of course a challenge to find the right balance and, and building off of what Michelle said, you know, the standards are there for a reason. Um, we want to achieve, you know, the highest possible response and, and services for the children and communities that we work with. Um, but it's, it is a golden standard and, and many, responses, even in the United States, um, we find ourselves falling short of, of these standards. So I think the, I think also, you know, lifting up and continuing to talk about how we struggle, how we continue to struggle with finding the balance between the need to respond quickly using global standards while also working with the most marginalized and vulnerable communities to create the change that embraces and celebrates local culture and local ways of, of working, but also seeks to, um, you know, understanding that, of course, we're, we're focused on humanitarian response and prevention, but also begins to shift the power dynamics to make more permanently, to more permanently alter the inequities that we see that are exacerbated by crises. Um, and a, a note too on, on the development of resources after I just shared that we are developing yet another resource for CP and EIE. Um, I, I think the way that, that we approach resource development, and I know that many, Many processes have looked at engagement um, and uh, collaboration at the, at the country level that would inform global level resource development. But I think we need to, to you know, think about what that really means in terms of true representation, knowing of course that within any national um, structure, you see power dynamics, you know, in play. And, uh, you know, thinking about who we want to be involved in both um, identifying and anal analyzing and responding to real inequities, again, that are exacerbated by um, crises, you know, how do we get the right people at the right table at the right time? Yeah, and, thank um, you. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Sorry, I, I would like to yeah, give no. enough time to your participants also to ask questions to the panelists. So thank you all for your responses. Um, so let's see, do we have any questions in, um, in the chat? I think I see one from uh, Konjit from UNICEF Ethiopia where he says localization is important to bring sustainable change, but it needs time, which may not be easy in short-term funding and challenging in humanitarian contexts where the family and social structures are broken and where there are few civil society groups, particularly women-led and local NGOs. Anyone would like to to respond to you. It's not say a question, but more like a reflection, I believe. So it's about the speed that uh, the question is around the speed that we have to respond at a meeting, matching the speed with, uh, with the localization. I'm gonna give a very general answer here. I think it's uh, a very good consideration. I think it, it will take time. I think we need to transform the sector and this will happen over time. And you know, becoming local will be a process and as we get there, we'll be even faster, hopefully, in responding to those emergencies because hopefully frontliners, those that are really on the ground will be better equipped to take all the, all the necessary steps to act as crises arise. So I am not giving any answer here, just a very general consideration around this. Over to you, Sandra. Yeah, thank you, Lena. I mean, this is indeed um, a true challenge uh, and it's not easy to, uh, to address overnight. Any other thoughts? 
I, I saw Rachel unmute first. I don't know if you'd like to go. Um, I also have a yeah, just quickly, and then it's probably <laughs> very similar to to what all of all of the other panelists are thinking. Um, you know, I think better and closer collaboration with our development colleagues and with our national um, structures. And we we talk a lot about um, the humanitarian development coherence, which is how INEE terms it, but I know it's been called nexus. And I think there's a, another one with the with a, a triangle. I can't remember what that one's called, but I think more intentional engagement, you know, looking within a lot of the organizations that are responding now, they have, there are development programs and there are humanitarian programs. And, and I think we can look at, you know, simple wins of, of collaboration within organizations, between networks, um, between donors or within donors. I think there's, there's considerable opportunity Yes, thank you. Yeah, and I think this links back to what I was saying around um, needing to capitalize on the strengths of local organizations and embrace what they are able to do. It takes the humanitarian sector a long time to gear up an, an emergency response. We are not able to necessarily be there implementing programming immediately. However, as we saw with the with the Ukraine crisis, there were local CSOs and local organizations who were already responding with what limited materials, supplies, funding they had. And so they were immediately responding as the crisis broke out. And it took, took the international humanitarian um, you know, you know, um, sector much uh, you know, longer to, to get there. So when we're thinking about working with local partners, we need to think about building on who's there, what their strengths are, and also thinking like, how can we support them in the immediate term to do this? Um, and I think there's also, so both embracing what is able to be done on the ground immediately as, and as Rachel said, working with, you know, with development partners or local organizations, but then also thinking, um, as I'm sure Elena would agree with is like, you know, thinking about capacity strengthening and how we can, you know, and thinking about prevention is how can we build capacity in advance? How can we work with local organizations in advance to strengthen their capacity to respond, you know, with our minimum service and our minimum standards and our minimum service packages in mind. But I think also just being aware that in the time of a crisis, we need to capitalize on what is there and who is already there and working and, and work with them and support them to be effective and, um, and to be working within what we standards what we have. Um, and so that's just some of my initial thoughts on that. Thank you, Michelle. Um, Jonas, do you have any, any perspective? Yes, thank you very much, Sandra. I, I'm very happy to see uh, different feedback from our colleagues uh, in this meeting. I, I know that, yeah, talking about uh, mid-term, long-term program, it's very, very interesting, but uh, what is also needed is to ensure that we know what are the needs from these national and the local NGOs. I think that doing a, a kind of a capacity or organ, organizational analyzing, analysis based on the existing capacities, it's very, very interesting because we need to know what is and the local NGOs, what are their weakness, what are existing opportunities, and what are they need? This is very interesting because uh, I have seen that many NGOs and donors are talking about funding access, what is very interesting, but also to strengthen existing capacities based to existing weakness, and also using existing opportunities these issues should be uh, seriously an analyzed to ensure that what plans we need to do in terms of supporting and the working and the collaborating with the national and the local NGOs. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jonas. Right, so thanks. Um, any other questions? Yeah, thank you, Gonjit, for your question. Anyone else would like, we have just a few minutes left, um, left, but enough time for one more question. But we know this is, uh, this is not easy, right? And this is, this is a process. And, and as I mentioned, as I opened this session, 
like this is a work in progress. We we are doing things. We are aware that this is not enough, and then we need to do more. And I think um, feedback from organization, national organizations, CBOs, like are also useful um, for us to know like where are the needs, um, what do we need to do differently. So feel free to to share your your thoughts on this in the chat or. Or even open your mic. I don't see any other other questions. Camila, do you see any maybe that I missed? No, but I think it's been a fantastic discussion. Very challenging, very frank. And um, I think that we've set the stage for more such discussions and uh, how we're going to think about developing our strategic plan in this area over the next few months. So, yes, thank you all for the discussions. And uh, we'll try and pick up on a few of them in our closing session that coming up shortly all right thank you thank you very much to all the panelists um we had um excellent panelists today so thank you to all of you and uh we wish you a good rest of your day there is still still some few more sessions i think in the afternoon um so you can go back to philo and um and select the session you want to attend thank you all Thank you. Thank you, Sandra and everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you, Sandra. Please do take a minute to share the feedback in the form if you can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.